You're listening to Let's Talk Creation, the science podcast that's just for you. All right, welcome back to another episode of Let's Talk Creation with Todd and Paul. I am Todd Wood. And I'm Paul Garner. And we are here this time for a very special episode. Um, I'll just warn you ahead of time here. This this episode may run long. I don't know how long we're going <laughs> to ramble on about this sort of stuff, but uh, we've decided that this is too much fun and we're just going to let it go and see what happens. Um, yeah. Before we get started, let me remind you, uh, we really appreciate your support, so please do uh, leave a like if you're watching us on YouTube, if you're listening on a podcast platform. We very much appreciate uh, your reviews. We appreciate those five-star reviews or ten-star reviews or whatever that your platform lets you do. Please do that. Subscribe if you can. Uh, click the bell for notifications when we put up new content. All that good stuff. Check us out on social media if you'd like to interact with us and make some comments on what we do. And we really do appreciate all of your support and all of your questions and comments. This is great stuff for future episodes. So, having said that, back to our um, very special episode. So, Paul, this week there is a movie debuting here in the United States. Uh, I think it's debuting there in the UK as well. Um, it's called Jurassic World Dominion. It is the uh -huh. final, well, the latest movie in a franchise that stretches back decades now. <laughs> um, the I think it's the capstone of this latest trilogy of films and it's all about dinosaurs eating people which seems to be mostly what these <laughs> movies are about um and we thought it would be good in in faithful social media tradition to capitalize on all the marketing related to jurassic world dominion and uh see if we can't get some new likes and new clicks and new visitors um, on our content uh, <laughs> by uh, piggybacking shamelessly on Jurassic World Dominion and um, talking about talking about dinosaurs and creation and Jurassic Park and so forth. So, yeah, absolutely. Why? Why not? Yeah, it's movie night. It's and the popcorn's here. Yeah, I'm got... afraid I can't share it with you. But yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. Oh, I got the movie poster here. I got my original uh, '93 <laughs> Jurassic Park teaser poster back there. So we're we're all decorated up, and and I see you're, you're wearing some what fun T-shirt there as well. Yeah, that's yeah, fun. my pterosaur T-shirt. This was the pterosaur exhibition when it was in uh, San Francisco. So excellent, yeah. excellent. I don't, but I don't have a I don't have a Jurassic Park T-shirt. I'm afraid. Ah, so. Wow. Well. Yeah. I had one, but I think I wore it out into a rag, and so it ended up getting tossed. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, I dug out my my poster there to to right. to decorate for this special episode. <laughs> so, all right, so here's here's what's going to happen. I, <laughs> we've invited <laughs> a bunch of our friends who know stuff about dinosaurs and paleontology and all that good stuff, and we're just going to sort of jam on. Jurassic Park and dinosaurs uh, and creation. Uh, we, we don't forget this is Let's Talk Creation, not Let's Talk Dinosaurs. Um, although I'm sure people would listen to a podcast called Let's Talk Dinosaurs. I, I don't think that would be a problem. But yes, we will we will try to wrap this back to biblical issues and biblical principles. So let me go ahead uh, in order of the people I'm seeing on my screen here. Our first guest is David Lee. Uh, Dr. Lee is a professor at... Patrick Henry College just finished his doctorate recently and he has a master's degree in paleontology and you might remember him those of you watching might or listening might know him from his very uh, successful and well-known podcast Popcorn Theology where he and his friends get together and there he is he's wearing a shirt good job represent man uh, I have I have uh, no shame there we go. yeah hey man I don't either <laughs> <laughs> so yeah he and his friends get together and talk about movies and theological issues related to those movies it's a lot of fun and so you should check that out i'm guessing people would probably be more familiar with that 
podcast than they would be with mine. But anyway, I don't know about fine. that. You've had yeah, some really good whatever. engagement. So. <laughs> We're really happy to have you here. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Our well, next so guest, <laughs> our next guest here uh, is a uh, paleontologist who his doctoral work is in dinosaurs directly. It's uh, Matt McLean from uh, the Masters University. There he is. Uh, he appears to have merged with a velociraptor or uh, something like that. Uh, what was recently. that doctoral research on? <laughs> you know, genetic engineering. That kind yeah. Of thing. yeah, yeah, yeah. Genetic engineering. There he is. All right. So, welcome, Matt. Um, Thank you. You have been involved with dinosaur digging at Art Chadwick's site. Is that right? That's right. For quite some time now. And uh, yeah, and as I recall, your doctorate is on T Rex. Is that right, too? It's part of it. Yeah. 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 yeah T Rex so cannibalism. That's pretty, that's pretty slick. Um, that's cool. I mean, that of all the dinosaurs that people know about, T Rex is the one. Yeah, right? that's the so one. That's pretty yep. cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. And our last guest, uh, guest is. Uh, currently the president of cornerstone education supply prior to that he was a professor and director of creation studies at liberty university he still adjuncts there as a professor and that is marcus ross welcome marcus hey great to be back you your work in your graduate program was on something called mosasaurs is that right that is correct yeah and I had to wait a long time to see those in Jurassic Park. Let me tell you, <laughs> a long time. That's right. Yeah. So those of you who don't know, mosasaurs are marine uh, creatures. They are not technically dinosaurs, but they were. They're found in the same kind, you know, levels of rock where you would find dinosaurs. So, so wow, this is going to be. Chaos. This is going to be chaos, Todd. That's a chaos. <laughs> chaos tissue. Chaos tissue. Um, yeah. A professor takes off his velociraptor helmet in uh, in California and it rains instead of snows here in Virginia. That's, it's weird. That's right. That's chaos. That's chaos. All right. Um, there you go. Uh, so well, I thought it would be good on this very special episode. I know there are a lot of creationists who, uh, let's say have some suspicions about, say, evolutionary indoctrination in movies and uh, have some questions about whether we should even be taking our children to see movies that are pushing evolutionary ideas. Others are worried about just secular worldview issues in films. And so, David, you're the, you're the movie guru here, I guess. Um, do you, what do you think about that? Should we be even going to see and spending our money on Jurassic Park stuff? Is that something that's honoring God or are we just getting brainwashed with evolution unwittingly? And, and what, what should we do about that? What should we think yeah. about that? Honest, honestly, I think the biggest risk of taking your kids to go see Jurassic Park is that they may wind up being paleontologists. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, per, perhaps financially, there's some, some negative uh, ramifications for that. But um, overall, I, you know, it's amazing to me that the, the majority of people that I meet, when they find out that I have a background in paleontology, one of the first things that they say, I would say at least half of them say, oh, I love that as a kid. I wanted to be a paleontologist. And I just respond, yeah, me too. I just didn't grow up. Um, and that I think, along with marine biology, those are sort of the two sort of parallel gateway drugs of science, if you will. Um, and I, I find that to be fascinating because there's something so otherworldly about these creatures that they're they're familiar, but they're different. They're they're other, um, and we we marvel at them as we as we should, as they are um, created uh, by by God and they bring glory to Him. Um, and so, in terms of how we interact with the media surrounding this, I think that that is a really important uh, question because it's, it's very common for Christians that I've, that I've spoken with to say like, oh, well, th their first hang up is on the things that they disagree with in a story. And I, I can certainly relate to that. But the problem I have with that is like, where do we draw the line with that? Uh, where do we stop engaging with, with entertainment or media because it doesn't agree with X, Y, or Z doctrinal points of ours. Um, we shouldn't expect the world to be producing media that is theologically sound. Um, instead, what we should do is we should engage 
with it. And ultimately, it does tie back to creation. And so we believe that because people are created in the image of God, um, then they're going to bear that image, whether they want to or not. And so as filmmakers make films and as authors write books, and even as you know, musicians write music, they're going to be bearing God's image in the way that they do this uh, unwittingly. And so ultimately it goes back to goes back to Genesis, right? And so we can say that even if they are not intending to bring glory to God through this, there are elements where they can't help but point to certain aspects of that. And so I think that um, we as Christians have a lot of leeway in terms of allowing us to interact with this media, but we should do so cautiously. Um, and in terms of the how, I, a very short kind of um, mnemonic that, I, that we often use for this is that we receive, reject, and redeem. There are certain aspects of stories that we can receive outright um, that say this does comport with the biblical worldview or at least overlaps with it. There may be other things that we have to reject, such as the concept of deep time, millions of years, naturalism. Uh, but then there are other concepts that we can perhaps redeem. There's discussion of stewardship. Uh, tremendous discussion of stewardship in the Jurassic Park franchise. And so how do we understand that concept as Christians? Uh, it's not going to be the same way that a naturalist would understand those concepts, but it is a an idea that we can we can redeem and we can bring some fantastic discussion out of. So I think that there's a, um, I think the biggest risk to not viewing movies like this is that you, you miss out on all those excellent uh, talking points, all of those excellent conversations. Yeah, it's a, it becomes kind of a platform whereby you can engage with other people in the culture, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an important point. So, yeah, I, I think you, I love that. Um, receive, reject, and redeem. I think that's I think that's that's right on the money. We don't have to stick our heads in the sand uh, with all of popular culture, but we do have to go in with our eyes open and our minds engaged and thinking about what we're hearing. But yeah, like you, I, I'm always suspicious of those people who are like, I got so mad. I watch National Geographic and I got so mad when they said this about <laughs> millions of years. And I think, okay, well, stop watching National Geographic. <laughs> Why would you be surprised by that? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. What's the deal? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's not it shouldn't be a surprise and if it's triggering you all this much then then what are you doing to watch something else anyway yeah take, take a deep breath right i mean that's, yeah, that's, exactly. that's my big, my biggest advice is it's, it's going to be okay it's all right <laughs> yeah there you go there you go switch yeah. to decaf or whatever yeah. <laughs> all right well that's a good that's a good thing to think about and, and i thought you know as we open it up to the floor here um maybe we could just um Talk about uh, just the impact of uh, Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park was released uh, as a novel in uh, the fall of 1990. I remember I was a just a new college student at the time. We used to find out about new books by going to this thing called a bookstore. It was in a thing called a mall. <laughs> Um, and, we, and I remember walking into the bookstore in the spring of 90, 91 there and just seeing walls of this, this white novel with these, this black dinosaur T-Rex right on the cover and thinking, wow, this is, this is big. And I remember picking it up and thinking, oh, it's a novel. Oh, well, okay. And then finally, <laughs> it's not, it's not actually going to teach me about dinosaurs. <laughs> And then finally, finally breaking down and buying it and reading it. And then uh, 93 was the Spielberg film. Um, my memory of that, goodness, it, I saw it opening weekend. I saw it Saturday afternoon at a matinee because I was cheap and a college student. Um, my, the biggest memory I have, you know, you know, the scene on the Jeep where they've been teasing you with dinosaurs throughout the whole first part of the movie. And then they're riding that Jeep and, and uh, what's your name? Sattler is blathering on about the plants and Grant is taking his glasses off and looking and doing that sort of business. <laughs> I remember that just absolutely took my breath away um, when they revealed those digital dinosaurs. It was when I was growing up, it was stop motion, right? Land of the lost, mm -hmm. Harry House and that sort of thing. That that was my, those yeah. were my special effect dinosaurs, and and I just remember muttering to myself, "This is real. These are real." Uh, I had never 
never seen anything in my life quite so breathtaking at that point. Just, 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 just the shock of, the shock of seeing this, this just changes everything in terms of what's possible at the movies and, and how realistic it was. That's, that's what I, that's what I remember about that original stuff and that original time. Um, anybody else have any thought, any memories of their first time with Jurassic Park? Did you all decide after, after seeing it, I'm going to go become a paleontologist. <laughs> Yeah, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> it looked so easy right in that opening scene, you know. That's yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you just you just have to brush Matt the knows sand all about off, that. Right? He just brushes all the dinosaur, you know, all the stuff away from the dinosaurs. And... <laughs> There's no real work there. Yeah. 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 Well, like you Todd, I was kind of brought up watching the Ray Harryhausen stuff, so all mm-hmm. the stop motion films, you know, Beasts from 20,000 Fathoms and 1 million oh, years amen. BC. Actually, I think my my favorite is probably The Valley of Guanji. I I love The Valley of Guanji. Oh Guanji. yeah. <laughs> so it's <laughs> a great, terrible great movie. Good movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And um I I'm also as as long-term listeners to this podcast know I'm a big Doctor Who fan and back in 1974 there was a story called Invasion of the Dinosaurs with these absolutely terrible kind of glove puppet type dinosaurs and ter- <laughs> yes. pterosaurs on string you know yes. um but I love it you know I, I I loved all of that um but this was just such a step up wasn't it in terms in terms of the effects that yeah. so was kind of yeah just radically different than anything we'd we'd yeah. seen before so how about you guys? I mean, were, were, were you queuing up to get into the very first screening or, you know, how, how did I you was. get to see it? Yeah, I yeah. was not. Uh, Jurassic. <laughs> no, you. <laughs> Let's I, see, I don't know if not. you were old enough to get in at the time. Yeah, four. <laughs> four. Uh, same here. Also four. So I was okay. uh, I was a senior in high school um, when when it came out. So I'm a few years younger than Todd, but not altogether too many. And um Jurassic Park was the very first um, opening night movie I ever went to. And it was just electric. Uh, it was wall to wall people. Everybody was there. You know, you're, you're buying your ticket, hoping that you can get in for the next show in a half an hour. And if not, you know, you'll be in the one that's three hours from then. And uh, it, that, that, yeah, that, that first scene where you see the Brachiosaurus, there are just audible gasps yes. in the audience. Everybody just, I, it was nothing like this had ever been seen before. Um, you know, we, we had hints and ideas that this was going to be good. Um, but we, the audience simply wasn't prepared. Yeah. We, we just weren't ready mm. for how amazingly realistic this was going to be. Mm. And, uh, you know, all the, all the little kids now who are getting to see Marvel movies and people punched through buildings and <laughs> all this sort of stuff, you know, just take for granted that special effects are amazing. Mm-hmm and that it might as well look real. This was the first real. This, yep. this was yep. the first time that you looked at it and said, I could be convinced um, that they happening. found real dinosaurs in Patagonia, just like you know Arthur, <laughs> Arthur Conan Doyle's Lost World uh, said that they did. And, uh, but yeah, that, that first night was an amazing experience. And um, I read the book about the year before, you know, once I heard that there was a movie, I was a little slow. I didn't get to the mall as often, you know, didn't have a car, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, um, yeah, read, read the book, uh, in, I think, uh, 92 or, or end 91. So I read it in like two nights, you know, I, I basically stayed up all night while I was supposed to be asleep and just read through everything in two days. It was, it, it was amazing. And I just read it a couple of months ago to my kids. Um, <laughs> Because, you know, that's a good bedtime yeah, story. Yeah, there you go. Uh, for the, <laughs> for the, that will you know, keep just, them up all night. night the yeah. being, being, speaking of being up all night, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So, yeah, just just watch the film with the kids to prep for this uh, podcast because they hadn't seen the movie and uh, and read the book to them a couple of months ago. So we're, we're all ready for today. All right, you're all set up then. <laughs> so sure. I guess, David and Matt, you guys saw it on uh, some kind of home video, is that right? Uh, VHS, right? I mean, I don't yeah. know about Matt, but I, I, I know that for me it was, <laughs> VHS, nice. it was, it was a good old, good old VHS purchase. We probably, as soon as it came out, uh, I doubt that anyone in my family saw it in theaters, but I do recall wearing that tape out. Um, and yeah, that was, 
you know, but as tapes would get worn out, you know, the yes, audio right. would do weird, weird things yeah. and occasionally get the little lines. Um, yeah. yeah no, so that I, I agree. It was, it was breathtaking, but I also didn't have quite the context of like, yeah. you know, like you said, the Harry house and stuff to compare it to. Cause I wasn't, I wasn't familiar with that. And so uh, what, what blows me away is, is how well it has aged, you know, a movie from it, it's 29 years old. Can you believe that that movie is mm. looks pristine today like the effects are fantastic um there's so much about it that should look really dated 1993 nothing nothing about it i mean the even the clothes like they just don't it doesn't look like it's in a different time to me i watch it today and i'm like this this is today this happened right now um and it's it's really remarkable because that staying power is quite rare um and it was because of the combination of special and practical effects i mean spielberg knew that the technology is kind of there but it's also you know, we, we got to use practical as much as possible. And man, it's, it, it works and it shows. And, and that's carried over some into the Jurassic World franchise where they have uh, tried to in insert a couple of scenes of practical effects um, to try and make it appear more real um, to very, I think, varying degrees of success. But, but uh, anyway, yeah, so that was my, my exposure was as a, as uh, quite, quite a young child. And it sounds like Matt's was, was the same as well. <laughs> I can tell you, um, you know, when you're talking about looking dated, the one thing for sure is the computers, right? Yeah, mm. I was going to say that. <laughs> oh, that's, that's the really Silicon good. Graphics it's computers. Got a CD yeah. 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 <laughs> it's um, interesting. Yeah, so when I was in grad school, I actually had a computer exactly like what they had. I worked on a computer exactly like that. It cost 10, 10 grand back then. Um, and. Mm. And it had a mouse. <laughs> it did. It did have a mouse. And it had that exact it file, new. that file uh, browsing system. You could you could use that on those those computers. But yes, that's very dated. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, for me. Yeah. You know, I don't really remember the first time watching it. Like, I know I was young. Um, the one for me that I actually remember that like really stands out was um, Jurassic Park 2. So I went and saw that one in theaters oh, when it came yeah, out. Um, so I was like, I don't know, mm. seven. Like I, I was pretty young. Um, and I was, my favorite dinosaur was always a pachycephalosaurus. And so that one has pachycephalosaurus in it. And I was like, this yeah. is the best thing ever, you know? <laughs> um, and now like I just why recently, your, I think. Why was that your favorite dinosaur? What's that? Why was that your favorite dinosaur? Because it's the best dinosaur. I don't know how else to answer it. Great dinosaur. Is it hard headed? Is that what it is? <laughs> We're grown ups. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, it's funny. Like I went back and watched Lost World, like Jurassic Park two, um, maybe like a year or two ago. And the first, like going through the movie, you're like, okay, yeah, no, all right. And then there's just this break where suddenly like they do all this stuff with San Diego and the TR and you're like, what is going on? Yeah. And so the movie just completely changes at that point. You're like, oh, okay, that was that was weird. Like I was not expecting that. Um, so yeah, no, it's a I, there is something very unique and special about the first Jurassic Park that I think none of the other ones have really been able to capture. Like even now, even though I wasn't there, I didn't experience it the same way that you guys did going back and watching it and being like this is a well done movie yeah like and you can you can tell it's it's unique and it's um it, it just holds up well and the other ones really don't i would i would even say like i went back and watched jurassic world recently which i was not a huge fan of that one but like even watching it again i was like yeah i mean this it just doesn't it doesn't have any kind of like a fresh you know feel to it at all right. but the first one still does yeah yeah, there, there's a sense of, of gravitas to it, I think, right? That, that is really hard. To, mm. it, it's hard to recapture that lightning in a bottle, right? And mm. th there's, yeah, yeah I, I agree that, you know, they can still be enjoyable movies, they can still be fun. Um, but ultimately, you can't, you can't necessarily recapture that same magic in, in a sequel. And I, and I had a similar experience with the Lost World Jurassic Park, which was that that was the movie that everybody watched over and over again. That was the one that, you know, if you had you know, people over at like a sleepover. That was the one that you put in like every time that in Space Jam. And you know, like you had to later be told like these, these were not quality cinema. And it's like, I don't care. They were the best at that time. Um, and so, yeah, I, I can, I can definitely relate to, to the Lost World uh, tie in there. It's no Valley of Guanji. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. No, it's not. And what's amazing as well, if you don't, I, you know, Todd mentioned the book earlier. What it, when you, in my case, I watched the movie, then read the book, um, and it was 
amazing to me how good both of them were and how different they were from each other. Yeah. You think typically, oh, it's a faithful adaptation or it's not. This was not a faithful adaptation because a faithful adaptation of that book would have been horrifying. Um, so I'm personally okay with, with the changes that they made to make it more marketable to, you know, young kids mm-hmm. uh, as, as one of the ones who saw it. it. It makes sense that they made those, those choices, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, but still, the, the the basic outline of the the island and Dennis Nedry sabotaging and go in having the kids there with the scientists and yeah, they cut out a lot of a lot of the stuff and they change it, but the basic idea is the same from the yeah. novel to the There's still film dinosaurs story. and both and everything. <laughs> and ultimately, as we all know, this is a movie about dinosaurs eating people. That's basically yep. what this is about. So right. Yeah. We all have our pretensions about uh, characterization and, and depth and all that stuff. People talk about, oh, I didn't like that movie because those characters, those situations were unbelievable. And I'm like, this is a movie about living dinosaurs that I resurrected yeah. from DNA and and you're worried about yeah. characterization. Okay. Yeah. Anyway. You basically want to see the guy eating on the toilet. That's I mean, right. that's, <laughs> you know, that's, that's basically what it's about. <laughs> I have very, very low standards, I guess. But but that's a good point about the lightning in the bottle because there's something completely, utterly new about the entire scenario in Jurassic Park, which you just, you don't have that novelty in any of the sequels. Everybody already knows that there are dinosaurs. They know where they came from. And so it's just a matter of sort of setting up who is the arrogant villain who is you know, going to abuse the dinosaurs and get in eaten in the end. That's really, it's just a contrivance to get to the, to the run and jump and be scared of dinosaur seats. Yeah. The, the screaming as Ian Malcolm would say. Right. Right. Yeah. The screaming. (laughs) Then comes the screaming. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Uh, So, yeah. Anyway. Um, well, thank you. That's, Good stuff. Uh, I, you know, Marcus, I, the number, you talk about it being electric. That is, that's the other major memory I have. Being as I saw it on at a Saturday matinee, I remember walking out of that dark theater into the bright sunlight of the afternoon and feeling utterly exhausted, like I had been just holding my breath for two solid hours. <laughs> oh yeah, and I was just ready for a, I mean, a nap or something. <laughs> I mean, the movie basically ends with the kitchen scene, which is terrifying. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, it was just a heart pounding scene. And you come out of that into, you know, the, the gallery with the, the T-Rex skeleton and, and the final showdown between the two raptors and, you know, yep. uh, the, the salvation that is actually found in, in T-Rex <laughs> in a sense <laughs> uh, in that, which is, you know, totally bizarre. But I mean, it is heart pounding to the very end of the film. Right. And then they give you like these two minutes of like, oh, now we're in a helicopter looking at birds. Okay. And then maybe I can get up and walk. <laughs> uh, it's, it's really, really tough. When you hadn't seen it before and you don't have your parents sitting there saying, don't worry, the kids aren't going to die. Right. Um, you know, <laughs> no, are they? Apparently, yeah. what I have to, <laughs> yeah. apparently what I have to do with my kids. Um, so, you know, otherwise there are nightmares. And then as a parent, you get to deal with mm-hmm. nightmares. Yeah. Uh, so you, you quickly learn why it is that parents give spoilers. I still hate them and I try not to give them, but if we're watching something late at night, yeah, maybe I might have to give a hint. My wife's going to tell the whole story the day before and we'll have to have a t- conversation about that. But, uh, <laughs> oh, no, no, no. That's no good. What are you doing? <laughs> don't, no. don't spoil it for them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, as far as the suspense, I mean, one of the things about this movie that I think is so fantastic is the is the score, right? I mean, so you've got John Williams, oh, an yeah. incredible score, and I love it. But I also like I like to listen to music while I'm working. This is a score that I really can't listen to while I'm working because yeah. it replays the movie in my head. And it's it's so compelling and so dramatic. And you're just like, like, you realize I'm, this is affecting my breathing. I should probably play something, you know, something else. <laughs> um, and, and it, yeah, it's, it's everything about it. The, the effects, the, the plot, the characters, it was, yeah, there, there was really no weak link in it, except, you know, like, like you said, the computer system looks a little dated, but that's okay. Like not, not a problem. 
<laughs> yeah, but if you didn't if you didn't know those computers very well back then, you might not understand how dated it is. But yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. They're just, they're still amazed that, you know, they've got this giant box for a monitor, mm -hmm. you know, my kids are like, what, what is that? What is that? Yeah. Is that? <laughs> <laughs> Why is it so big? <laughs> it strikes me as so supremely odd that we laugh about this, this technological advances. Technology goes so fast after being so slow for millennia. Mm -hmm. um, and now people are like, look at this, look at, you know, you watch episodes of the X Files, and you see Mulder pull a phone out of his pocket that is the size of a football, and you're thinking, "What is that?" Sophisticated <laughs> yeah. communication device, Todd. It's very sophisticated. Right. Right. Yeah. It has enough battery power for a 15 minute call. Yep. <laughs> That's right. As long as as long as you are close enough to a tower in the city that you can actually pick up signal. Yeah. yeah. Crazy. Then you stuff. have to put it back in the trunk. <laughs> yeah. Technology. <laughs> so yeah, so Jurassic World comes out. I guess that was 2015 when it first hit. Um, shamelessly capitalizing on nostalgia from the uh, original. Um, and you know what? I thought it would have been better with Aubrey Plaza in it, so we could watch April and Andy running from dinosaurs. <laughs> that would have been pretty cool. But we got what we got. It's fine. Um, we we got Chris Pratt. I mean, yeah. yeah, you know, this guy pulls off nostalgia in multiple movie, you know, universes. That's right. So they know, didn't I mean, use Chris last Pratt. Last movie I well. saw, he got a Microsoft Zune. I mean, that was that was pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> He's gonna bring the Zune back. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. But yeah, yeah. no, I, I think I agree with Matt. He he was. Uh, he wasn't used as well as he could have been used, probably. Yep. Um, but I still it was still fun to watch him. You know, Chris Pratt is is always, in my opinion, always a joy to watch uh, in a yeah. movie. He's he's always fun. Yeah. And see, I was the person what? at the. I went to go see Jurassic World in theaters with with three paleontology students. Um, that nice. was fun, mm -hmm. and I was the person who was audibly laughing at all the wrong parts because um, it was <laughs> like, what is going on right now? I mean, my favorite part, you know, you've got like the the. Um, what is it, Indominus, you know, breaks into the, the, the aviary, which is full of pterosaurs, whatever. Um, and, you know, breaks open, pterosaurs all flat. What are they going to do? All instantly go down to the docks and kill everyone. They kill can, everyone. Right? Like, yeah. that's what you do, <laughs> like, for sure, as an animal. Like, you're like, it's revenge shot, you know? No, like, they just fly out and go their own way. I'm like, why would they go do this, you know? Oh, yeah, look at that. Meanwhile, I want I want a hamster ball. I mean, <laughs> Those seriously. Were cool. Those were really cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the giant human hamster ball. That was pretty. What could go wrong? This one actually yeah. it works. You, you send it down, it, it, it rolls. And I did not understand <laughs> the giant human hamster balls. What happens when you roll over some dino doo doo and now it's yeah, all see, over your giant blop. human hamster yeah. ball? Yeah. <laughs> how does this work? How, does, how do they keep it clean? There's no wipers. Perpetually yeah. while you're rolling around in it. There should be a squeegee system. Yeah. yeah, that's right. One giant squeegee along the top. That's, that's, that must be it. Yeah. But this yeah. is what we get for being smart about dinosaurs now and adults. And now we can look at it and go, oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> I do have to. Th I have to say, I thought Fallen Kingdom was better than what people said about it. I waited Thank to you. see it on yes. home video because everybody was saying it was terrible, and then I watched it and I thought, well, that was that was fine. Mm -hmm. I mean, people got eaten by dinosaurs. It was a total, you know, <laughs> a new way of doing it. Not on an island somewhere, so we didn't have the pretension of why am we going back to this stupid island again? So <laughs> I, I didn't think it was that terrible. And I think the trailers for uh, Dominion look kind of fun with, you know, chasing after the, the duck-billed dinosaurs on horseback like you're a bunch of cowboys. Mm -hmm. That looks kind of cute. It's, di it's Dino Ranch, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there you go. That's right. <laughs> Those are young kids will understand. I, I, I want to know who, um, whoever gave them insurance to build that new Jurassic World. You know, right? Who, who thought that was a good risk? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's a that's a good point. They're always they're always dying, and they're like, you know what? We can make it work this time. It's going to be yeah. fine. It's not a problem. <laughs> It'll be fine. Right, right, right. Yeah. We can go back. I bet the lawyer and, was sitting on the toilet while he was doing the underwriting on that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, brother. Yeah. I, 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 I have to say. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. 
as a as a CEO of a corporation, Cornerstone Educational Supply, as yes, our, our giant co- company, I, I took great offense at just how wicked and evil all corporate America is is portrayed in Fallen Kingdom. I mean, apparently, we will destroy the entire world for money that we then can't use because the world is done. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. For an amount know, of money, we know that, we that is actually you, pretty conservative. I mean, I was re- I was rewatching it recently. You know, like he's like, oh, ten million dollars for this thing, and I'm like. You funded a team to go down to this island. Hold on, I don't, I don't know much about this, but it seems like you might be breaking even, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> well, they're breaking something. Breaking something. That's yeah. for sure. They, they broke kind of everything. Yeah. yeah no. Uh, Jurassic I think even World, the, uh, fa- uh, sorry, Fallen Kingdom, in a lot of ways, paralleled uh, Lost World Jurassic Park, except that they sort of flipped it. Right in Lost World, we get uh, maybe fifteen minutes in San Francisco or wherever they ended mm. up. And then in um, in Fallen Kingdom, we get most of the movie is is in America or at least half of it or thereabouts. Uh, so they, they sort of flipped that, but they were really, in a sense, I think parts of the story were stretching because there, there was a lot of similarity to the original trilogy there. Uh, sure. And kind of like with the new Star Wars trilogy, you can you can only r- really ride that train so far, um, right. in, in my opinion. Well, that's what I think. um, That's actually why I enjoyed Fallen Kingdom more was like when you watch Jurassic World. I mean, it's just like this is nostalgia and you must appreciate it now. Like it it felt like when you watch um, Force Awakens, that it's like, no, there's a Death Star. No, there's got to be this thing. We have to do exactly everything the same. It's got to start in a desert planet, you know, like all that kind of stuff. Um, But I think with um, with Fallen Kingdom, the really the great part they brought back from Jurassic Park was the the awe of the dinosaurs like when just the the shot when they're they're leaving the island and the volcano is going off and you see the brachiosaurus that's stuck behind there it's like yes that is that is for me what what makes jurassic park jurassic park is like you're supposed to be like wow and and i never had that moment in jurassic world where i was like wow when i looked at the dinosaurs um Mm. and of course it had a stigmolic too so that was that was a great win right there for a director for fallen kingdom that had like a role in the movie. okay yeah no that's that's what i'm all about that's what i'm here to see nice. <laughs> yeah well you brought up a good a good point and i think we've sort of been skirting around this uh so let's just directly address this uh one of the things that struck me about the original jurassic park was the degree to which they tried to make these creatures seem like real creatures Right. So you had the Dilophosaurus with his big frill and his spitting venom and you had T-Rex that can't see you if you don't move. Um, And that made it, I think, from perhaps a non-professional perspective, seem more real because Mm -hmm. you have this you have real life things that, you know, animals might be like that are sort of projected onto these dinosaurs. (laughs) But... You dinosaur experts must must know there are places where you roll your eyes and go, that is not, <laughs> that is not right. <laughs> not even close. Fill us in on a few of those things. Let's nitpick for a couple of minutes here. Matt, okay, why start. don't you, you got okay, a good here one? here we go. Yeah. So I don't mind the speculative stuff. You want to pop a frill on a Dilophosaurus? I'm cool with that. You want to have it spit venom? That's fun. Like, why not? I mean, the whole idea, if I understand correctly, was supposed to be that like Dilophosaurus couldn't, like because of the paper thin bony crests on the head, Uh that it was like dangerous for it to go and fight with things like it might get hurt. And so they wanted it to like have a way to incapacitate the victim before it, it went for it. And it's like, okay, like that's speculative. That's fun. Like, I like that. I think it's more the problem when it's like stuff we know that they're just not doing right you know so like you've always got the bunny hands and all the dinosaurs right where they're they're like okay. walking around with with their hands um with that's, the palms facing down that's not and it. dinosaurs don't do that you know like a median dinosaur the the palms are facing each other so they can clap their hands all the time like that's that's what it's <laughs> supposed to be like you know so it's just things like that i think that for me like because my thing is pterosaurs <laughs> for the most part the it's hard watching the pterosaurs and all the jurassic park movies you know they're picking up people with their feet it's like they can't grab things with their feet. Their feet are kind of like our feet. They walk around plantigrade. Like their 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 feet are, you know, can't grab anything at all. They're gonna grab stuff with their mouths. Um, so there's just like weird details like that where it's like, I mean, I think we just expect it as moviegoers, like, oh, of course I can pick up things with his feet because it's a flying bird thing. And it's like, well, no, actually it wouldn't do that at all. I had no idea. There you <laughs> go. 
Well, I've seen, you know, we've <laughs> seen that he... for, for years. We saw that in the, in the, in the, uh, the stop motion era. Harryhausen movies have pterosaurs yep. flying yep. down yep. and grabbing people and flying mm-hmm. away, flying away with them. And now you're telling yeah. me this is all a lie. They can't do I'm that. I'm so sorry. Oh man. <laughs> I mean, kill him. Yeah. If eagles can do it, pterosaurs should be able to do it. Right. And that's, right, that's right. the notion, but it's like, well, not, not exactly. Yeah. No. Somebody, somebody want to tell me about the velociraptors? <laughs> Uh, the slices well, that you, you know, hear or hear. Oh, uh, okay. Sorry, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Marcus, <laughs> you know it, it's one of those things that uh, we've all picked on before because we know Velociraptor is a much smaller animal than what's portrayed in the movie. Um, but they actually have justification going back to the book on this. Uh, since I just read it, uh, I had forgotten that what what Crichton did is he took uh, Deinonychus and Tyrops, which is the, the basic big model raptor that they use for uh, Jurassic Park. And uh, the argument that he used in his book is that that is the same genus as Velociraptor mongoliensis. And so in the book, he actually combines the, the two under the genus Velociraptor and has a North American Velociraptor, Deinonychus and Tyrops, and, of, and the Mongolian Velociraptor mongoliensis. And so he actually does make a, uh, a taxonomic discussion uh, or a taxonomic argument in the book that this should be Velociraptor. Mm. I don't know if he was reading Greg Paul at the time or, or what, probably, um, but he was he was taking a lumper approach to the uh, to the taxonomy there. And so I've been I've been, you know, having that in the back of my mind is this, you know, garbage criticism of uh, the movie and the book for 30 years now and just went. Oh well, I mean, I don't agree with with that, but he did make the right he did make the right move in the book to start calling them Velociraptors. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. fair enough, fair enough in that. It, it's, yeah. it's like what Matt was saying. You know, that's that's a move that it would be speculative in a sense, but is at least a, a justifiable yep. sort of thing to do. And and in fairness, Velociraptor is easily the coolest name that you could possibly have for. Yeah. for- <laughs> for a, a raptor a man a raptor and dinosaur i mean it, yeah it's, it's, otherwise we'd be talk, talking about the nickuses yeah yeah yeah, yeah. nikai <laughs> dinox Nikuses? so just from a filmmaking perspective yeah. it needed to be that and it needed to be roughly that size but but yeah that's a good point and i, I definitely don't remember that from the book so i'll have to go reread it <laughs> yeah and i think it's not the only size issue is it because dilophosaurus i think is much larger than the animal that's shown in the movie yeah mm. Um, and, uh, and I'm sure Marcus can tell us about the Mosasaur as well. (laughs) Mosasaur. It it actually changes size, I think, from shot to shot. I'm not sure it's always consistently the same. (laughs) Yeah, the T-Rex. Yeah, in the original movie, the T-Rex was, uh, it it was the incredible shrinking T-Rex. It was getting bigger, getting smaller. Mm -hmm. The Mosasaur is perhaps the most egregious, Mm -hmm. um, of, Mm -hmm. of all of them. Unless there's some of the pterosaurs that really ought to be like yay big that they decide to make, you know, the size of an airplane um but <laughs> when i first saw the the scene where the mosasaur you know comes up out of the the water to get the great white shark and i i remember sitting in the theater <laughs> total nerd just calculating going oh the average great white shark is about 12 to 15 feet long it's a, <laughs> ooh, all right so we're looking at like 130 feet ish for this mosasaur which is nearly three times <laughs> the size of the actual thing but you know, all you have to do is say genetic, genetically modified oh. organism, and you could do whatever yeah. you want with special effects. There you go. Physics need not exactly. apply. Yeah. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. We can have we can have forty pound pterosaurs picking up a baby triceratops. <laughs> no, um, and we can apparently have yeah, you know, a, a mosasaur the size of a skyscraper. I mean, it's just mm-hmm. impressive, crazy big. Yeah, yeah, most impressive. Yeah. Um, the other animal I thought we probably should talk about is the Spinosaurus, because mm. there's kind of an interesting story behind the reconstruction of Spinosaurus, and the the current view of what it what this animal looked like and how it behaved is not at all like the movie, right? So, who 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 wants to tell us about Spinosaurus? <laughs> um, I'll start us off. So. So Spinosaurus has a long and complicated history. I'll try to sum up as best Mm -hmm. I can. So the early 1900s, they got fossils out of Northern Africa. And Stromer, who described it, 
He's got some long vertebrae with these huge spines on the back, and he's got some pieces of jaw, some other fragments. Realizes it's a meat-eating dinosaur with a big old spine fin thing on its back. And he, like any good paleontologist, puts it in a museum. Little did he know that museum in Germany was going to get, you know, totally leveled during World War II when the city was bombed. So um, remains are completely lost. And we had, you know, what was um, recorded in photographs and drawings and things. So um, people knew it was Big Mediator, fin on its back, that kind of thing. And um, they kind of just drew it as like a T-Rex or an Allosaurus kind of thing with a fin on its back. And it wasn't until um, the latest 80s, earliest 90s that Baryonyx was found in England. Um, and it's this really weird dinosaur with like, you know, the, most of the body is like a median dinosaur, but it's got this big crocodile like head on it. And people, as they started looking at this, they realized, oh, Baryonyx and Spinosaurus are very similar animals. And that actually the preserved jaw piece that we have the photos and drawings of for Spinosaurus, it does match up with Baryonyx. And so they realized it had this big crocodile head. So that's just before Jurassic Park 3 came out. And so that was the big, like, we got to have a big, big, new, big, new bad guy. He's got to fight a T-Rex. We're going to make him a Spinosaurus because he's a big dinosaur, you know, except that like Spinosaurus would probably just hang out by rivers and catch fish and, you know, probably wouldn't pick fights with T-Rex, but whatever, you know, we're going to make this work. And, um, but then in what, 2014, it was discovered that it's a much weirder animal than anybody knew. And so they found out that it, it, so there's a bunch of debates still about this, but it looks like it's a pretty aquatic animal. It had really stumpy back legs, kind of looks like a wiener dog dinosaur almost. Um, Cause it's like really stretched out <laughs> and the back tail has these long <laughs> spines on it too. So it looks kind of like a tail of a newt on the back. It's a really bizarre looking creature. And it's still like, actively debated what this thing was up to what it exactly looked like but it's you know it's a long animal it's longer than a t-rex um and just a really crazy kind of creature probably looked at what paul was was seeing on his doctor who episode there you go yeah, yeah. <laughs> take next next thing we'll do is we'll take a wiener dog and we'll stick a fin on it and we'll, we'll... Run the so many they used to do that where they go on us yeah 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 <laughs> <laughs> uh, for sure yeah for sure wow that is, yeah. I mean, that is fascinating. The, so the Spinosaurus is the main scary dinosaur in Jurassic Park 3, which is kind of the redheaded stepchild of the original the original trilogy. Um, <laughs> unfortunately. I think that's no offense, Matt. Uh, I think Jurassic sorry about Park that. 3 was better than 2. <laughs> <laughs> I liked 3. I didn't think it was that bad. And it's directed by yeah. Joe Johnson, who did all sorts of great stuff. Did uh, yeah. Rocketeer. He did... Uh, Captain America First Avenger, oh, yeah. he invented Boba Fett. I mean, come on, who can't like this guy? His movies are pretty cool, <laughs> I think. Anyway. I think Jurassic Park 3 is very underappreciated. You know, as mm -hmm. Jurassic Park 2 got so big and bloated and crazy, yep. um, you know, it's so tongue in cheek with the, you know, the dinosaurs chasing the Japanese people um, in, yeah. <laughs> in California. Yeah. You're like, ah! and you're like, that's funny, <laughs> but, but a little cheesy, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, and, and, you know, in Jurassic Park 3, it was a shorter film. It was only, you know, an hour and a half, hour and 40 minutes at the most. And it just got back to basics. There's people on the island. Dinosaurs are eating them. Run. Yeah. That, that's yeah. it. Yeah. There's really nothing <laughs> There's else. There's a family that needs to be drawn closer together during this process. And yeah. yeah, yeah. It, it's a, it's the same good. story, I mean, same type of story points. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. but yeah, you're right. Jurassic Park 2 is definitely, I mean, it, it, it was at least two movies worth of stuff. Just kind of just shoved in there. Like, we're going to have a long... <laughs> lengthy scene where we're outrunning the dinosaurs and then there's going to be gymnastics involved and yeah th there's there's a lot there's a lot in, in too. Oh, <laughs> but again best movie ever when i was a kid so <laughs> you grew up and you come to realize things you watch it with different eyes and you didn't make the team yeah right i mean <laughs> yeah, great line yeah. yeah yeah no that was but we all, uh, those of us who are paleontologists, especially uh, appreciate Jurassic Park 2 for the play that it had on one of the paleontologists oh. that we all grew up watching, yes. and that was Robert Bacher. Yeah. So yeah. he, yeah, <laughs> he apparently had been bragging to people that he was an unpaid and unattributed consultant to Jurassic Park That's 1. That's right. Um, and word got back to Spielberg about this who decided to then kill him on screen in his next movie. Uh, you know, make him, make him the bad guy who's, who's working with the other company to steal the dinosaurs and then have him freak out with a snake only to be eaten by a T-Rex. 
My guess is Bacher thought this was great. I mean, I have no idea. I, <laughs> I have Matt, no doubt that's Matt, true. You know, you know Bob Bacher, you know better than than any of us. Uh, has he ever mentioned anything about uh, the Jurassic Park, you know, kerfuffle? Uh, not really. I mean, he's he's indicated that for sure that was based on him and that he does like it um but uh, yeah i mean that's that's for sure anything else he hasn't said anything so. i mean that that's kind of the ultimate achievement for a paleontologist thing is to appear in a jurassic park movie and get eaten yeah. by a dinosaur yeah it's, yeah it's, not, not and, and he and he, couldn't, and he couldn't, be a, couldn't be a more recognizable paleontologist yes, right. that, that's yeah. the thing right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for those exactly. of you who don't know who that is, it, mm. in the in the second movie, it's the really hairy guy with the really scruffy beard, long beard. Like he a wears hat. a cowboy yeah. hat. I mean, yeah, he's yeah, like this, hat. He's yes, just this real vest. obvious character. It is That's Bob Bacher. Robert Bacher right there. I mean, <laughs> every, television sh- every television special in the 1980s and 90s, mm-hmm. if it was a good one, had Robert Bacher. Yeah. If, if it didn't have Robert Bacher, it was by definition not a great documentary. <laughs> this just, he was awesome to listen to. Yeah. He was just so excited. Yeah. He always looked like he had just come back out of four months in the desert. <laughs> yeah. And mm-hmm. and I think that's pretty much what happens. It's like just every year he just wanders out to the desert. He comes back with Triassic dinosaurs. <laughs> and that's that. <laughs> and, and a lot of bizarre ideas. Um, yeah, that's what he was. I remember I read his book, Dinosaur Heresies. Um, oh, everyone did. Uh, yeah, I mean, that was the thing. You, you did in the 90s. and uh, They even mentioned that in the first Jurassic Park movie yeah. when, uh, when yeah. Timmy is, is asking. Right. I, it's like, you know, I've read this other book by this guy Bacher. named Bacher. His book was a lot thicker than yours. Yes. <laughs> 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 yeah. oh, Matt's getting it. You have that? Yeah. Oh, we all we all read that. It was yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. Hey, hey, hey. There we go. Wait for it. I got mine. Ooh, Here we go. No. Oh, yes. Yeah. Signed by Robert Bacher. Yeah. Uh, and and it's a it's a thick book. It's, it's it is a thick. thick. Book. It, it is. is. Timmy was right. Timmy wasn't kidding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because my recollection of the heresies it. were that dinosaurs were fast moving and warm blooded mm-hmm. and um, a lot more active than the way that we had envisioned them and depicted them in popular culture, that they are not these slow, slow moving sluggards that you had in the Ray Harryhausen films. These were Mm -hmm. scary fast. Yeah. And, and, and then in the Maya with the Maya source stuff, you know, he would argue, I think that's Bacher as well. He's arguing for nesting behavior and taking care of young and things like that. So, these are yeah that was that was jack horner jack horner sorry and jack horner was the the model of course for alan grant Mm -hmm. in uh in the book and in the movie so uh that's that's we're we're getting to see jack horner thank you yeah i i'm getting my 90s era paleontologist mixed and we up. actually do get to see jack horner in <laughs> jurassic world he has a very brief cameo and see so you, you do see his face for a moment uh, he's oh. one of the he's one of the guys that is like high-fiving somebody after chris pratt does the whole uh dog training of the dinosaurs scene um <laughs> oh, oh wow yeah, didn't so, if you didn't know, Not that. know that yeah he's he's, he's in that scene <laughs> all right well cool all right. Well, let's uh, let's shift gears a little bit here, and uh, so we're supposed to talk about creation. I suppose we should do that. Um, <laughs> oh, I got one let's that's really creation. important. I saw the Dominion, the Jurassic World Dominion trailer, and mm. there is a very controversial bit in this trailer. There's a very clear shot of what appears to be a heavily feathered dinosaur. Is this true? Do dinosaurs have feathers? Are we going to get in trouble by by addressing this topic? Probably. Do I care? <laughs> Not really. The so let's just good, go good for it. ratings. It's good for downloads. It's yeah. good for ratings. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> good. Controversy. Todd, you're crazy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Tell me about dinosaur feathers. Where, where, uh, why, when I saw the original boo. Jurassic Park, <laughs> no feathers <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So up until this point, we really haven't. And this has actually been one of the complaints that I've seen from uh, from some paleontologist friends that why don't we have any feathered dinosaurs in the Jurassic Park movies? Um, largely because, you know, 1993 and you have iconic yeah. dinosaurs being introduced. Um, Jurassic Park three 
has uh, some some feathers on the on the Velociraptors, and mm-hmm. and that's about it until I, I think the Fallen Kingdom. The Indoraptor had some of the feathers, feathery looking follicle thingies going on again on its head. Uh, other than that, I can't think of any others that off the top of my head had feathers up until uh, Dominion. So they're really doubling down on it at that point, right? Yeah. Hmm. So, yes. And Jay- I, 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 oh. think, I think the um, it was a conscious decision, wasn't it, by Spielberg to make all the dinosaurs kind of, um, you know, not, not look too feathery and, and to have basically gray or brown skin because he, he thought that technicolor dinosaurs wouldn't be scary enough mm. so i understand that was a that was a deliberate decision that makes sense so did we know about dinosaur feathers in 93 is that something that we i i, I remember this so, being more of a later development when <clears throat> or did we suspect it in the 90s there were fossils coming out of china that had feathers or feathery like things on them um, but they were all really small dinosaurs um, you did have you did have some raptors. I mean, you had Cynornithosaurus, um, which which had feathery stuff on it. Um, but it was still very much that kind of like maybe Velociraptor had feathers on it, and if it did, maybe they're just these little tufts occasionally. Like there wasn't like a consensus that oh, this thing was fully covered with feathers. But that's been like since then. You know, more and more fossils mm-hmm. keep coming out of China and then even Canada and Germany and some other places where. You know, you've got clear feathers on things that we've traditionally called dinosaurs, you know, for for decades. So like members of the um, the same family as Velociraptor, the Dromaeosaurids, you know, you have Microraptor and um, uh, Tianyraptor and a few other ones that that are fully feathered um, with flight, you know, with, you know, what kind of look like flight feathers and not actually one, but um, what we call penaceous feathers. Um, and so, yeah, putting them on on a raptor dinosaur makes a lot of sense. You know, if they had covered a Brachiosaurus in feathers, I mean, that doesn't really make any sense. Not only because we don't have fossils of that, but I mean, this animal is what, 60 to 80 tons? Like, it's going to overheat if you do something like that. So, Mm. yeah. Brings us back to the X Files and spontaneous dinosaurian combustion. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) So, are these real? uh, I got to ask. on behalf of all the skeptics out there, are you sure that, that paleontologists aren't faking this and it's all just a scam to get us to believe that turkeys are T Rexes? Uh, like a six foot turkey. Yeah. yeah. Can you can you can right. you address that question? I think that's an important thing to talk about. Well, I can say from my own experience because I, having grown up um, in the in the nineties when dinosaurs didn't have feathers. Um, you know, the, the, the specimens that Matt's talking about started showing up in like 96, 98, mm-hmm. 97. You started seeing these things that have a little bit of fuzz on them or, you know, at the end of the tail, there's a couple feathers sticking out and people are like, what? You know, and it's not until, you know, you get something like Microraptor completely covered uh, and shown. I think that was 2003 yep. or 2004. Um, so growing up in the and reading the Croatian literature in the 90s you know everything was there are no feathers on dinosaurs yeah. and there's no evidence for it and, um, and and there's no good reason why there would be anything like that anyway right because feathers are for flight was the, the common type of argument and nobody's going to argue that something like velociraptor is trying to fly it's obviously a, a ground-based running animal um, so it was it was Microraptor that really changed my mind in 2003. Up till then, I was willing to at least grant, you know, there's there's a lot of skeptical reasons to be unsure about the others. I was wrong, but you know that I, at the time I thought that it was fairly reasonable. And uh, as soon as I saw Microraptor, then it was like, well, no, we have something that skeletally was already recognized as a dinosaur. It's definitely a raptor. It's covered in feathers. Ergo, raptors have feathers. And um, so, you know, I made the switch at that point. Uh, most creationists, you know, 20 years later still are pretty skeptical, uh, despite really, you know, uh, lots of evidence. And, you know, Matt's got a, a very big paper that was published in the, uh, the 2018 ICC that goes through in great detail uh, lots of the different organisms that were known to that point. And there's more that just keep showing up. Um, so, you know, for, for us as creationist paleontologists, the three of us are here, um, we haven't, you know, we haven't seen any particular problem with having feathers on dinosaurs. And I think that, you know, 
Spielberg didn't want to put feathers on back in the 90s, not only would it have looked really possibly weird, but there, there were a lot of paleontologists that weren't so sure about that at the time. Um, and then it just became part of the Jurassic Park lore, right? That it's canonical. And in a sense, because the people are genetically creating these organisms, they made them without feathers. You can at least say that's the blueprint. And it, all of our paleontology friends are like, yeah, but they can change that now. <laughs> and we're like, yeah, yeah, they should. And so we're finally in this last movie getting a, a chance to see Velociraptor the way that it's done on say a Discovery Channel special. Um, only far more menacing um, mm -hmm. and uh, dangerous to to human beings, which is good. <laughs> somebody, good. <laughs> somebody, somebody, tell us though about Archaeoraptor, because I know some of our <laughs> listeners are gonna are, are gonna think about this. So, Archaeoraptor was this thing that was publicised by National Geographic, right, in nineteen ninety nine. Yeah, yeah. And it basically turned out to be uh, a fake. Yes. Basically, parts of different fossils sort of pasted together. Um, to, so somebody just tell us the story of Archaeoraptor. So um, Steven Zirkus was the guy who got hold of it, and um, he was all excited about it, you know, because it, it's a cool looking fossil. Um, and he mm -hmm. called on, I think it was Phil Curry um, to help him out. And, um, you know, Phil is telling him, slow down, like, let's go through peer review, you know, we'll, we'll publish it that way and everything. And Circus just calls National Geographic, you know, and so like totally <laughs> circumvents that. Um, and the uh, you know National Geographic's thrilled about this. They they run the thing to cover issue. I want to say it's ninety eight, maybe it was ninety nine. Um, and they um, you know they put it out there, and sure enough, yeah, no, it's a it's a fake fossil. And this is a problem you get not just in China, but it happens in Brazil and Germany, anywhere you've got really nice preservation. Um, where you know that if the fossil looks really spectacular, you can get more money for it, right? So what they'll do is, hey, I found a broken piece of this fossil, broken piece of this one, boom, stitch them together and, you know, put something over it so you can't see. And yeah, that's going to sell um, for a lot of money. So what people tend to think is because um, Archaeoraptor is fake, therefore all of them can be fake. And it's like, okay, well, you know, a couple of things to keep in mind here. Number one, it wasn't creationists that caught Archaeoraptor as a fake, right? It was it was regular evolutionary scientists. They were checking things themselves. They they want to not put out things that are fake, right? And they've got various reasons for doing that, but they want to they want to be um, truthful in their science, what they think. The second one is, you know, we have means to detect these things. So, you know, when you put these fossils under typically like ultraviolet light and different things like that, you can see the cracks, you can see the plaster, it, it stands out. And so people have accused even like Archaeopteryx, which was found back in the 1860s and 70s, they've accused that of being fake. And, you know, people have taken it, put it under those, they put it in X-ray synchrotrons, everything you can imagine. And no, it's real. Like this is a real fossil. There's even original feather material still there, which is really cool, you know? Um, so we, we need to not automatically assume it's the same thing with hominins right i mean todd you talk about this all the time i'm sure like with sure. Yeah. people coming up Pilt to you and bird. oh but yeah. piltdown man, Pilt -down you know, man. Nebraska yeah, man. Yeah. like yeah. yeah i mean no just because there was one or two that were forgeries doesn't mean we should question the whole thing yeah 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 archaeoraptor sure. thinking of that was even called the piltdown bird you know for <laughs> for a while yeah. um and, and then yeah to add to what matt has said there you know this <clears throat> when we use the word fake here for the fossil it wasn't a real singular fossil it was a composite of three actual real things yep. so mm -hmm. you know it, it wasn't where somebody is sitting there etching feathers you know onto the limestone or something like that. that's tedious like really tedious <laughs> but rather it it was three actual fossils that then got you know disentangled one of which was microraptor mm -hmm. as it turned out yeah right. um and, and i don't remember if that was the first um uh, fossil of microraptor um mm -hmm. or or if it was uh, just assigned to it, but it was recognized as, oh wait, this is, you know, this this back half over here belongs to Microraptor. And uh, so, yeah, it was it was actually made with real dinosaurs. You know, it's kind of like, you know, my chocolate bar, it's made with real chocolate, it's you know, made with real dinosaurs uh, <laughs> and other things. And it, you know, this got teased apart. That, that does a terrible joke, okay, that, <laughs> that didn't work at all. Uh, but I promise volume, not quality. So. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like to, getting to ramen noodles from sam's club oh, I wanna, right? it's, it's a lot but in the end you're like no yeah no. I, don't, I don't think that was good for me <laughs> i want to clarify this make sure our listeners got what you just said there archaeoraptor 
is a true, real feathered dinosaur, just not as Archiraptor. They took a piece of a real feathered <laughs> dinosaur, stitched it together with some other thing, glued it together, and that became the Archiraptor fake, which is totally different from Piltdown, where they literally took a jaw of a gorilla, a, a orangutan, I mean, and a skull of a human mm-hmm. being and put them together to try to get us to think yeah. that these are Violet ape men down. when that was not what it was. You actually have, your situation is actually, there was a real feather dinosaur in there. It was just put together with a bunch of other stuff that was not a feather dinosaur or not yeah. actually right. belonged and, together. And the, yeah, the Microraptor piece uh, didn't have feathers. Yep. Right. That, that part didn't have feathers. But now we have plenty of other Microraptor. That, okay. So yeah, it turned out that Archaeoraptor, yeah, just tease it apart and you still have a feathered dinosaur. <laughs> yeah. Whoops. So so the people <laughs> crying out that this is all fraud and it's, they're actually missing an important point there that the fraud was actually made of feathered dinosaurs. All right. Well, that's irony. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And it's fascinating because it seems like there, there's such a strong reaction against this idea. I remember watching Matt's talk mm-hmm. at the International Conference on Creationism in 2018. Yeah. And, and there was, there was some, uh, some lengthy discussion following that. Yes. With some folks. Yes. And, to say, to say the least. And, and honestly, this is something I encounter with students on a regular basis. There are certain concepts that are, um, they're ingrained, right? And it maybe mm-hmm. is ingrained from 10 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, and it just sort of sticks around. And it has staying power. You guys did an episode uh, on the, the canopy theory, for example. Yeah. Yeah. That that yeah. would be a good example of one that that's, has uh, some, some staying power. And, yeah. and honestly, so much of it is, is just fascinating to me because the degree to which we are unwilling to question our prior assumptions and prior um, prior beliefs is, is we, we tend to view it as defense, right? We, we fall into a similar defensive mm-hmm. posture uh, mentally as when we are attacked on something. Mm-hmm. And it and it's fascinating yeah. because ultimately it, we as Christians should be called to to so much more than that. We should be called to truth and to mm-hmm. um, intellectual humility. And um, and we are called to those things. We need to get better at at uh, displaying them at times. And you know, of course, that, that that can apply in a number of different areas. But um, you know, to to quote something that you guys said at your talk, you know, we we don't get to decide whether or not these things existed. Um, that, that's that's not up to us. Yeah. Um, instead, what we get to yeah. do is is figure out how do we make sense of them uh, within a biblical right. worldview. Right. Yeah. And frankly, I I find it sort of baffling, really, that that this becomes such a sticking point, because there is nothing in the Bible that says that God only created birds with feathers. There's nothing that so much as hints at that. So, you know, to to make this a hill for creationists to die on seems to me such a strange thing to to do. Um, And I I think it's only because of this notion that... um, that essentially birds are the modern descendants of dinosaurs, mm. that this question of feathered theropods becomes such a big issue for people. But, you know, we I, I, again, I, I, I don't really understand it because, um, you know, we, we're, we're quite happy to think about, um, you know, b- bats being kind of flying mammals and then you've got whales that are swimming mammals and all this kind of thing. So, you know... Um, so having feathered dinosaurs, um, that, you know, fe- feathered animals that cluster within the dinosauria to me, doesn't seem such a big deal. Um, I, yeah, I, I just find it very strange that people get so hung up about it. And for that matter, the, the number of flightless birds that we have that I, I would say most are, yeah. most creationists would probably argue are unique created kinds. I, I don't know where the research is on all of them, but, sure. um, I, I don't think that it, it, it's, it's interesting if you say, well, what about what about flightless birds that have feathers? And they say, well, they were birds and they descended and, and became land dwellers. Well, that's an evolutionary argument. Mm-hmm. Is, is that something that you're willing to concede in order to, to argue against feathered dinosaurs? Probably not. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I have my doubts that the, the, I think the land dwelling birds, the non-flying land dwelling birds, I don't see any evidence there that they were ever flying at all. So, mm. yeah, you have evidence of, of creatures that uh, already have feathers and do not fly. But, of course, they would say, look at the beak and look at the laying eggs and the making of the nest. They're clearly birds. <laughs> they have it all except for the flying part. Yeah. 
But yeah, like Paul, I don't see, I don't understand quite what the fuss is about that one. That just seems to be to be to have become one of these hot button issues that you can hardly even bring up. And and David, I was I was at that I was at Matt's talk at ICC as well, uh, and I remember the heated 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 discussion. People not quite yelling at him, but <laughs> close to yelling yeah, at yeah. him. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. <clears throat> I think they even put you near like a break time with that talk because it yeah, was well, like we know we're going to spill over the time slot, so we're just going to put it right before lunch, and people can that's, can that's have, exactly can have you guys. Happened. They're like, we can do uh, questions as long as you want. Yes, just keep yeah. coming. Yeah. And I'm sitting I'm in the, the audience going, up here. "No, that's we can't. Don't here. do that. Are you crazy?" <laughs> well, it was funny too because um, you know the talk, like almost I think right before mine in a different room, was Ken Colson changing the flood pre-flood boundary or mm -hmm. pre-flood flood boundary, and I'm like. That's way that's more a controversial. Big deal. We should be arguing about that. I'm not, you know, whether he's right or wrong, but like that's something that has huge implications across yeah. like multiple disciplines and fields and creationism. And here we are just saying, hey, there's some fossils that have feathers and they're things we call dinosaurs. You know, it really has very little in terms of like big reaching um, perspective outside of a very narrow field, you know, but that's the mm -hmm. thing that we've latched on to as a yeah. thing and, and i think it comes back to that like it's what we've done like we've argued for so long yeah. that they don't have feathers that you know dinosaurs have nothing in common with birds and i just think it's very hard to like just change your direction when you've been really focused on on saying this thing and very very convinced of it you know mm -hmm. yeah yeah I and mean, when you when you've and to be a lot about it or you know as yeah. as an organization you kind of staked this as you know this has been what we've always said and the idea, I think, is unfortunately that if we give any credence, you know, if, if we give any ground to, you know, what the opposition has said, in this case, evolutionists, um, then uh, then we're not going to be able to stop them from being right about other things, right? If they're right about this, then they could be right about it all. Mm -hmm. And so they can't be right about this. Like, well, this mm -hmm. this actually doesn't entail all. Yes. But yeah, that seems to be the perspective uh, for, for some on this. And uh you know, at least for the for those who are watching, you know, here you've got, um, you know, five creation scientist folks over here and, you know, three of us who got training in paleontology. We're all OK. <laughs> you know, we're all OK with, with dinosaurs having feathers and uh, yeah. don't think that this is uh, in any way something, as Paul just said, you know, yeah. anything that really seems to threaten creationism in any way. The Bible doesn't talk about it. And yeah. um, it, it talks about there being flying creatures. Mm -hmm. like the, the word in Genesis one is, is not even bird. <laughs> it's, it's just flying stuff. So, you know, we've, we've got plenty of room uh, for, for letting, you know, God's world tell us what it is that he made. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Matt though, you, uh, you put feathered dinosaurs in the title of your ICC paper, you know, what, what you, you, you should have expected attention. <laughs> what were you thinking? Yeah. <laughs> you were asking <laughs> for it. <laughs> <laughs> Ken, Ken, Once Ken's again, talking. Chaos. Boom. Yeah. Ken, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the title though was "Feathered Dinosaurs Reconsidered," so that left it kind of yeah. open. Oh, like, oh, yeah. maybe. see, that was even more yeah. trouble because then people came in, you know, didn't read the abstract, and they're like, "Oh, he's gonna like." you know, he's going to demolish oh, this. Yeah. Are we going to debunk this yeah. idea? Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That was a bad but, call. But Ken, Ken's talk, you know, although it deals with the pre-flood flood boundary it's about stromatolites or microbial eyes <laughs> nobody makes blockbuster movies about stromatolites <laughs> right? so you know it's inevitable matt that your talk was going to get as well just attention. stare at the painting the whole time yeah. it's not like you need you know moving film for this <laughs> yeah well you know it's it's funny that we're like going back to to what paul was saying about their you know thinking of it in bigger categories it, it part of that problem is that the only living things we have with are, you know, with feathers or birds, right? So it's like we connect that automatically with, oh, birds have feathers, just like all our living reptiles, except for leatherback sea turtles, are cold blooded, right? So, like, we automatically say, oh, that. And so we try and carry that back into the past. But, you know, even, even just yesterday, a new article came out with uh, in Nature that they got a beautiful fossil of a pterosaur, so not a dinosaur. Um, and they're able to find melanosomes, so the things that help you tell what color a creature is, right? In the crest of the pterosaur, this big soft tissue crest, this thing. Wow. And it has this fuzz that we've known pterosaurs have had for, you know, we've known about it since the 60s and 70s. And people have constantly been like, are these feathers? Are they not feathers? And the, the new paper 
you know, you've got branching things with little plumes coming off. I mean, it looks, it looks like a feather, you know? And so, okay, well, dinosaurs and pterosaurs are very close relatives of each other. So maybe you're thinking about a whole bigger group of animals that can have feathers, you know, but it's just that we only have one small chunk of it that's still around today. And we got used to thinking that's what has feathers. And so I think that's a big, um, a big contributor in this whole discussion as well. Yeah. Wow. Well, let's 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 talk through some other things here. So, fun movies, um, people getting eaten by dinosaurs. I, I enjoy, I enjoy it just like the rest of us. Um, where where are we putting dinosaurs in creation, hmm. and how does that work? So, I on guess, the land. <laughs> I guess I guess there's Indian a couple museum. of things. except spinos- there's... except spinosaurs, right? <laughs> yeah, right. There's a couple of questions here. One would be timing, right? Mm-hmm. And when did they live, and and that sort of thing. Um, uh, because as creationists, we have a much shorter understanding of Earth history than 65 million years ago, and when dinosaurs ruled the Earth or whatever. Um, I guess there's the question of what are they in terms of say created kinds if we don't believe they're evolutionary whatevers or proof of evolution or whatever uh there's that question and then i suppose what happened to them uh if it's not an asteroid zapping them in the yucatan and wiping out all of the dinosaurs then uh where are they going where did they, where did they go so i guess where did they come from when did they arrive and and where did they go those are my those are my questions so what do you got for me anybody have any ideas (laughs) not joe that's all i got (laughs) i was thinking (laughs) where do they come from where do they go (laughs) well in terms of the the time frame for that you know it 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 is important to distinguish that we hold to a young earth creation model um you know here on this podcast and and in this group and so we we while we can accept certain aspects of uh, what we see in the Jurassic Park films, we reject other aspects. We reject the time frame. We reject the notion of naturalism, um, that only naturalistic evolution is responsible for the diversity of life that we see. And, you know, we would frame that around the context of the biblical time frame that is given to us in, in Genesis. And so we're told um, the events of creation took place in six, what appear to be rotational literal days, and that couple, you know, 1600 or so years later, approximately, we have a flood uh, and that that flood took about a year, covered the entire planet um, and would likely have left a significant mark in the geologic record. And so in terms of when dinosaurs were alive, um, they would have been land dwelling creatures created on day six. Um, Although I guess we could maybe quibble about Spinosaurus or some of these sort of aquatically uh, derived creatures. Um, and, And I do like to double down on the notion of flying dinosaurs and swimming dinosaurs not being real categories. Um, as, as fun as it is to, to mess with my, my, my friends on this, it's, uh, you know, that, that's inaccurate. So mosasaurs are not swimming dinosaurs. Um, they would have been day five creatures. Uh, so the dinosaurs, yeah, day six. And then because we find them in flood sediments, the Mesozoic rock layers um, are part of the geologic uh, column associated with the geologic time scale. We can accept and study and understand the column without conceding the time scale. And that's what creation geologists have done uh, for, for decades now, at least, and, and, and longer. And so what we're able to look at is the Mesozoic rocks and the layering and the order of those layers is significant and is something that is, is helpful to study, even the Jurassic, if you will. Um, and so yeah, basically we only see them in what are most likely flood sediments, meaning that they would have lived up until the point of the flood. Presumably some of them would have been taken aboard the ark uh, based on the description that we see in Genesis uh, in Genesis 6 of the creatures that were brought aboard the ark. And then they would have uh, walked off the ark on a very different planet, uh, a, a lost world, if you will, uh, or, a, or a fallen kingdom. Um, depends on how you how you wanted to, to describe it there. <laughs> so so you have dinosaurs living with people. I have to ask because I'm sure some of our skeptical uh, listeners might be wondering. Do you think that the Flintstones is a documentary? <laughs> Goodness, I hope so. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Well, that's. 
good to know. Um, That's what Matt, I've got. <laughs> I don't have a more sophisticated answer than that. <laughs> I don't either. It's it's a it's you know obviously people are asking that to make fun of us, but then at the same time I'm like, well, I, I don't I don't know. <laughs> I don't obviously not, but at the same time, huh? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what to think about that. So, scripted, Matt, animated, you, inspired by real events, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> there that's, you go. That's, that's good. <laughs> Matt, you've written about created kinds and dinosaurs. I know you've been working on this. This is something that you've been very, very interested in for a very long time. Can you? I mean, are, are we talking about massive evolution of dinosaurs? Are we talking about a limited number of created versions of dinosaurs? Are pterosaurs dinosaurs? I guess there are no flying dinosaurs. There are no swimming dinosaurs. Well, see, that's where I have to disagree with David. Because if we're counting these feathered dinosaurs as oh, dinosaurs, oh. there would be some flying uh, dinosaurs. Fair enough. So, I should qualify. I mean, pterosaurs are not flying dinosaurs. Pterosaurs my, are not flying dinosaurs. My apologies, we'll Matt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. They were right. when I went to school. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, this is um, the, the kind of the... the Biggest work that's been done on this was done for the ITC. It was Neil Doran was leading that with his students. And I jumped in on it because um, I think he got tired of me like nitpicking and commenting. And so he's like, just get on the paper. Um, <laughs> and so, um, you know, we we looked at as many different groups of dinosaurs as we could. I think the, the most important thing to communicate to people right away is a dinosaur is not a type of animal in the way of like a dog or a cat. Like it's a big category of animals. It's like saying you know, mammal or something like that, where you've got lots and lots of what we would expect to be different created kinds. And it makes sense if you think about it, right? Like, you know, you look at like a Brachiosaurus and a Stegosaurus and a T-Rex, those don't really have a lot in common, you know? Like I wouldn't look at each one of those and be like, oh no, those are probably like, you know, brothers and sisters. Like, no, these are these are very different creatures. Um, and so, you know, what we came up with you know, we, we didn't look at every group. We got we got as, as comprehensive as we could find. We had a lot of trouble finding stuff on sauropods, oddly enough, um, which are the long neck dinosaurs. But um, we were saying, I think at minimum, there's probably at least 35 kinds of non-avian dinosaurs, so non-bird dinosaurs. Wow. Um, probably more than that. Um, and especially consider, of course, we don't have, um, you know, uh, fossils of every creature. And we we're still discovering new things all the time. So, you know, yeah, I, I think it's not it's not unreasonable at all to say, you know, it could be 35 to 75 different kinds of dinosaurs um, um, somewhere in that kind of range. And so that's a lot of animals. Um, and yeah. you can um, you can recognize some basic types, I think, pretty quickly. You know, like um, I, I was just at Target the other day and they had a bunch of the Jurassic World toys out there. So, of course, I stopped to look at it as I was walking by. Oh, look, there's a Therizinosaur. And um, it was funny. There's this mom with her kid there and she's like. They got every kind of dinosaur here. <laughs> that was, no, no, they do not. You know, um, oh, that's lady, like, if you only knew. There's only yeah. like maybe like five, five kinds of dinosaurs, something like that. No, we're talking about you know over two thousand species probably of named dinosaurs, at least fourteen hundred. I mean, there's a bunch out wow. there. So this is a this is a huge group of creatures. Wow. Um, and so um, you know, when you look at something like a Stegosaurus, yeah, you recognize the Stegosaurus doesn't look like a Triceratops or a T Rex. But there's all these other species of animals that are like Stegosaurus, things like Kentrosaurus and Chiangosaurus and Wirhosaurus, like all these animals. And so we can easily recognize all those as, hey, those those have the same body plan. Like those are all, it's just this, you know, plant eating animal with these plates and spikes going on its back. Sometimes the spikes go up half the back. Sometimes it's all spikes. Sometimes they have giant so shoulder spikes or hip spikes. But like, other than that, it's the same kind of creature is the idea. And so you know, doing the, the statistical barominology, which you guys have talked about that before in the podcast. Um, you know, we're, we've done that on those dinosaurs and, and been able to find most of them are the groups we recognize. They make sense. Um, what, what look like created kinds. Cool. So creationists are actively not just digging up dinosaurs, but actively studying and trying to fit them into a creation model as well. Yeah. That's pretty exciting. Um, all right, Marcus, you've been quiet over there. Where did they go? <laughs> Are they still okay. around? Could I go to the jungles um, of Africa? Could I go, they go to the Hollow Earth? Tui? Yeah. Uh, oh, the Hollow Earth. Yeah, there, there we go. Uh, good old Jules Verne and, uh, and, and the beginning of real science. Um, yeah, where did they go? So, um, yeah, that's a, that's a difficult question for us because they're, you know, as Matt was just saying, like, we have a lot of different ones. And if, if, 
somewhere, let's just throw the middle number, I, 50 of them are, are brought on board the Ark. What happens afterwards? Why aren't they running around uh, killing people today? Why is Jurassic Park, you know, not just like any other day uh, out there? <laughs> Praise the Lord, right? It's, just, it's not. Um, so we have we have a little bit of explanatory work to do over here. And I, Kurt Wise, I think, had had put a, a good point to this is that um, when you take a look at the plant communities that are typically associated with the dinosaur fossils, uh, if you're looking at uh, the Morrison Formation in uh, Colorado, Utah, et cetera, um, it, some people might not realize that when you find a, a dinosaur bone bed, like what Matt work has you know worked on now for quite a number of years over at the Chadwick dig, um, is that there's other things that are found along with that, uh, not just dinosaurs and not even just like one kind of dinosaur, there's a bunch, but then you also get things like you know, pollen, you get wood material and plant tissue, you might have fish scales and all sorts of other things that are part of the entire ecosystem that is, you know, associated with the animals. Now we care about the dinosaurs a lot because that's what we all love, uh, but there's lots of other really cool and interesting stuff that's found along with those dinosaurs, little mammals, uh, various types of lizards and, and other reptiles of, of different types, but the plant, uh, community is interesting because Kurt had noted that when we look around the world, the plants that we see that dominate the world right now are not the plants that seem to dominate the ecosystems in which the dinosaurs are primarily found. Uh, those are mostly gymnosperm plants, you know, large tree ferns and cycads and uh, things like that. And you look around the world today and those plants, when you do find them, are in very marginal environments. They are really pushed off to the side compared to the flowering plants, uh, the the, um, the angiosperm group that totally dominates the world today. And so Kurt had made a, a supposition that you know if the dinosaurian uh, plant communities don't thrive after the flood, then that is going to wreak havoc on the reestablishment of a dinosaurian ecosystem. Um, it, it certainly is going to explain, I think, a lot of why we don't have uh, dinosaurian herbivores uh, around. It might not help us entirely with why we don't have dinosaurian carnivores unless their behavior is very specific to uh, predatory behavior towards certain types of creatures. Um, so I, I think that uh, that helps us to explain why dinosaurian communities did not reestablish themselves. Um, also given their larger size on average than mammals uh, and birds and other animals might have been a competitive disadvantage in the world that had been ravaged by the flood and is now resource poor. If you're an animal that has high resource requirements and there's just not much out there compared to an animal that can burrow underground for a little while and wait it out until some things grow or, or th some things die and take advantage of, of that, then that might put the dinosaurs at a distinct disadvantage compared to other organisms. So those are some of the, the clues and ideas that we might have about why it is that dinosaurs, if they are brought on the ark, don't reestablish themselves. Um, and you know they may have hung, out, hung on for a while, but it, it, at least to me, I don't see them hanging on for very long. I'm, I'm not big on a lot of the dinosaur and dragon war uh, type of stuff. Uh, I, I just don't find it has quite enough evidence for me to jump on board for it. Uh, yeah, somebody made a tapestry in 1400 that looks like maybe it could have been a cetacosaurid, um, but I don't think so. I think it's just a weird beastie. Um, <laughs> it's just kind of what they drew, you know. Um, so with, with that, I think the dinosaurian community, along with lots of other things, I mean, we're, we're talking dinosaurs here, but the fossil record is chock full of stuff that isn't with us right now. I mean, huge amphibians the size of, of crocodilians and, you know, stuff like that. Oh, Matt's got a book. What do we got there, Matt? We got a medieval bestiary. Oh, nice. <laughs> I was just going to show you their drawing of a crocodile so everyone can understand when he yeah, says that they're drawing right. beasts. Um, yeah, in the medieval bestiaries, is... you, you often get people drawing animals that they've never seen before. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. So it can get pretty weird. It's pretty weird really fast. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> well, and, and, I, I can't find you're... the crocodile at the moment, but this is this is right right there. That's great. We've got some kind of snake that? creature with wings attacking, huh? possibly a elephant. I don't know what that is. Nice. It's got a weird lip. Yeah. So <laughs> no, I mean like, it's a taper. Yeah, maybe. yeah, maybe. There you go. 
yeah. yeah. So I mean, yeah. So yeah, a wing, a winged dragon, uh, type of thing yeah. that somebody you know heard and has you know written or, or read because Plato wrote about it at some point, you know, or what have you. And so yeah, obviously there must have been Atlantis and there must have been dragons because Plato knew about these things. And you're like, uh, <laughs> did Plato see them? Um, you know, I, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, now, one of the, the other things that had been brought up earlier, uh, Todd had mentioned the, um, uh, the asteroid impact. And David had said nicely that, you know, we can agree on the data of the geological column, you know, that that representation of different types of rocks with characteristic fossils found above and below other types of rocks that have characteristic fossils gives us, you know, this, this overall vertical record, if you will. And in that record is evidence of a giant asteroid impact that while just pretty bad and, and left evidence of itself pretty much globally. And we can geochemically trace this stuff uh, to the impact site in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. Uh, and that seems to be coincident with the last dinosaur fossils, uh, stuff that Matt is you know, excavating up in uh, Wyoming is really close to that last border. Um, but one thing that's, I think, underappreciated in uh, creationist writing about that, even including my own, is that, you know, those are just the very last of the dinosaurs. There's, there's been dinosaurs that have been dying and being buried in the flood for a real long time. So when we think about, you know, where that is, and it's, it's at the last of the dinosaurs, that's what most people consider to be the extinction of the dinosaurs following lots of other extinctions until we get to the T-Rex, Triceratops communities and, you know, things like that. But from a flood perspective, it is, in a sense, kind of merely coincident with some of the last few dinosaurs that are um, that are buried uh, during the flood. Um, and then, you know, we have a question of, well, what happens afterwards? You know, is that then the beginning of, of other biomes that are being destroyed during the flood or is this after the flood? Um, and it, much of us here are going to be in, in broad agreement that what's above that is probably after the flood. Uh, but there's a lot of other creationists who think that we're still in the flood for some time. Um, before we eventually get to the post-flood period. Hmm. But since I'm the, I'm the guest up here, I'm right, you know. And, uh, <laughs> of course, <laughs> of course. We would, we would never right. start a fight with you like this. And Oh, of course no, not. No, no, no. Of course not. <laughs> Hold on to your butts, right? <laughs> well. <laughs> I don't know. Paul, you got any more questions you want to ask these guys, our dinosaur panel ex of experts here? We don't we usually get to do this. Well, I suppose the only question in my mind is what do dinosaurs tell us about God, the creator himself? Um, you know, we, we read in Romans one verse 20 that the invisible attributes of God are clearly seen through the things that he's made. What do we perceive about God when we look at dinosaurs? Wow. I mean, honestly, one of the big things that, that strikes me, and especially with these movies where they're beginning to explore more and more of the uh, of the species of dinosaurs, um, is the just the beauty and the diversity within these groups that God didn't just create functional organisms that could that could suffice. They can just do their job and and, and survive, and and that's all. Uh, or you know, to put it in in Malcolm way, uh, find a way. <laughs> <laughs> but ultimately, he creates them with an incredible amount of diversity. And um, we also see many of them were designed or designed as a theologically laden word there, but that have features, I should say, uh, that make them appear to be very effective killers. And so, you know, just like the titles of these of these movies, um, we tend to see that there is a that there is a fallen nature. We see this fallen kingdom um, in in relation to the curse that God has placed on uh, creation following the sin of Adam and Eve. And so, I think that obviously there's a lot of discussion that can be had about how do we get to these uh, features that appear to be really effective uh, at at hunting and killing or at avoiding predation. But regardless, we see beauty in God's design. Um, and then also the brokenness of that. We see the we, we see Eden, but we also see the ruins of Eden in a way as well. I think two um, two things we see that obviously God's power on display, um, and I mean these are um, the reason that they make good you know movie monsters is because they're genuinely huge and terrifying. Like that's that's yeah. incredible to think that these were real creatures at some point. And going along with that, you see in in God's design, his his um, his intelligence and planning and engineering and design of these things. So, 
you know, the, the most marvelous ones to look at, even though they're not my favorite dinosaurs, as I already said, but like sauropods are incredible. I mean, when you see an animal that, that could weigh something like 60 to a hundred tons, yeah. um, that could be over a hundred feet long and it's walking around on land. That is mm. crazy to behold. I mean, when you look at the, the history of paleontology, when they're, when they were discovering these things in the early 1900s and the middle 1900s, they were convinced, oh, they're too big to walk on land. They must have been living in the water. They must, they must have been, you know, supporting themselves there. And it's like, these people are are literally disbelieving and doubting the engineering prowess of God. Is really what it comes down to. Like, no, no, no. There's no way that could actually work. Like, we we we're we're smarter than this. We know better. And it's like, no, you've got footprints of these things walking all over the place, right? And when you actually look at the design of these creatures and you realize, you know, their feet. Like they, they basically turn it all the way around to make a circle and they walk on that. And some of them, the titanosaurs, they have no phalanges at all. They have no finger bones. They walk on their metatarsals that make a circle to make a column. Um, and you think that's, that's crazy. Like that's amazing design. When you look at the, the neck um, of these creatures that they can have these, you know, crazy long necks, 20, 30, 40 foot long necks. And the vertebrae in there are they look almost like honeycombs um they're they're designed to be so incredibly strong and yet light at the same time and then to have a unidirectional breathing system like a bird where they're bringing in this air so that they never have dead space in their neck so they don't just you know fall over dead from getting um, poisoned by their own you know carbon dioxide leaving and stuff like that it's it's really fantastic design and so we we shouldn't just look at these things and think oh that's something of the past like whatever it doesn't matter anymore like no you're seeing a brilliant masterpiece of God. Um, you're seeing something that you think we would never have thought to design something like this. And, and God did. Um, and so you're, that's what's so exciting about paleontology is every time you excavate something, you see something for the first time, you, you are being exposed to the glory of God. And then we get to then take that to other people and say, look what God did. That's, that's really cool. Mm. That's great. Any final thoughts, Marcus? Well, Thinking about the the last three movies, or you know, this last one coming up, we have Jurassic World, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, Jurassic World Dominion, and it's interesting how the last two titles are playing off of biblical concepts. Uh, yeah, um, yep. this Fallen one especially, Kingdom and and yep. this one especially, yeah, with Dominion, and you know, in the trailer they they show Ian Malcolm saying, you know, we don't, we're supposed to have dominion over this world, we don't have dominion over you know over anything, and um, you know, it's not the first time that that uh, Ian Malcolm has made allusions to the biblical text. Uh, not they're not frequent they're not often I and mean, he's not the sort of he's not the sort of guy who's usually going to be quoting the bible uh in this but um it, it is interesting uh, to see what particular tack they're going to take you know on this i i'm really i'm really geared up for this movie i, I think that certainly yes it's hitting the, the nostalgia points by bringing the whole band back together right we we got the original party we got the new guys and, and my kids think that you cannot watch a Jurassic Park movie without Chris Pratt. I'm just going to say it, right? I mean, <laughs> if you if you don't have him there, well, you know, they're all watching the original one. It's like, but is Owen in this? But when like, does no. Owen show up? Yeah. <laughs> like Owen's Owen's my age, and so you know, Owen's in high school uh, in this movie, and uh, you know, but but for them. You know, because there, there's the Legos uh, movies, there's, you know, the other stuff that's going on. Uh, Disney has got a, another uh, show of Camp Cretaceous oh, yeah. uh, on, on their channel that streams. And uh, it's it's every bit as ridiculous. It just involves teenagers making the stupid decision that adults usually do. Um, and <laughs> we've kind of come to that conclusion. This is pretty much you, you need people to make bad decisions all the time. Um, and so some of my kids don't do well with that because they hate seeing kids get in trouble. <laughs> it's like, well, <laughs> it's pretty much well, what the show is. Lots of kids getting in trouble. It's, it's a cautionary um, tale, just like it was for adults, right? Just like, yeah. especially the book. It's, it's yeah. a yeah. huge cautionary yeah. tale. And, and to, to piggyback on Marcus's point, I did pull up that quote from the trailer because it, it just jumped out, slapped me in the face. Uh, yeah, it's, it's Ian Malcolm's voice. We're racing toward the extinction of our species. We not only lack dominion over nature, we're subordinate to it. And I'm like, oh my goodness. I, I'm so excited to talk about this movie because you know, we talked about receive, reject, and redeem, right? Let's reject that. Um, it's just straight up. That is that is not what we're told in scripture. We're told the right. exact opposite of that in scripture. Yeah. Um, we're not subordinate to it. We have not only uh, authority, we have responsibility. And that should that should be a, a sobering uh, wake-up call. So to you know, to where we don't have 
the responsibilities of the character seen in this movie, life and death decisions related to these to these creatures. Uh, we do have life and death decisions related to plenty of other creatures that are still around on this earth. And how are we managing that? How are we doing with that? Um, well, arguably we could do better. So that's something that um, I'm, I'm excited to have discussion about because even just putting the word dominion in the title, they're just, they're just begging for, yep. for a response from Christians and, uh, <laughs> and, and it's coming. Don't worry. <laughs> once, once we see the movie, we're going to be, uh, we're going to be talking about it over on popcorn theology. And then nice. I'm sure in, in tons of other um, venues as well, there'll be a lot more um, reaction and discussion surrounding whatever they mentioned related to dominion in this movie, which again is, is one of the recurring themes throughout the entire franchise. So yeah, uh, we'll we'll definitely you know have our opinions getting out there, but only after we pay our fifteen dollars for you and you and you. And you. <laughs> <laughs> They're gonna get our money. Right. They're gonna oh, get let's our face money. it. Uh, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> so prediction right now yeah. with the title Dominion. Okay, so this is the first Jurassic Park movie that's gonna have a synapsid in it, a nonmammalian synapsid. So they've got a Lystrosaurus, so one of these mm. little pig-looking things with a beak mm. from the Permian Triassic. So what you have to understand with the geologic column, Permian extinction wipes out almost all life, right? List yep. resource is one of the few animals come out and it rules the world. Okay. It's got dominion over the world and the evolutionary model. Uh -huh. So here we go. This is it. Life is going to be wiped out again. Lystrosaurus is going to take over this genetically engineered Lystrosaurus. This is what the movie's about. I'm calling it right now. That's the whole plot. Lystrosaurus looks like the love child of a pig and a turtle. I, yes. It had its chance. It had its chance. <laughs> <laughs> they brought it back though, so it gets a second chance. So we're oh gonna get, get get a, a Permian prequel trilogy yes. uh, out of Love this it. as well. So <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah, thinking about go. your your theme uh, of, of um your receive, reject, and redeem. One of the things that oh let's say it bothers me. Um so Jurassic Park from the beginning is is frankenstein right it's basically yeah. a remake of frankenstein and along with that comes what i call frankenstein ethics which consists of just because you can do a thing doesn't mean you should do a thing which is essentially the very first the very first question in any ethical dilemma right and and it doesn't give you any advice on how to make decisions like that. Um, and unfortunately, I see these this Frankenstein ethics happening over and over and over and over and over again. And I, I, I note, you know, thinking about what does this teach us about the Lord and what does this teach us about God's creation? And I, I, thinking in terms of dominion and people having dominion over creation, we need to make some pretty wise decisions about a lot of issues. Mm -hmm. And if the only thing in our culture that we have as a point of reference for that is Frankenstein ethics, and it, it seems to me that we are somewhat crippled. And I think of that especially, and I'm gonna get real controversial now, in COVID, here we have, <laughs> here we have a potentially life-threatening disease, right? Spreading across the country. And we need to have some really difficult, challenging, um, mature conversations about the ethics of what we're going to do about it in terms of both personal and in terms of public policy. And I think Frankenstein ethics has just left us with, well, you know, who knows, right? Just because you can make a vaccine doesn't mean you should take it. Or just because there is a disease doesn't mean you should believe a scientist that tells you that it's dangerous. And I think, I think it's left us as a culture in some sense... Uh, very immature and un in incapable of having these really hard conversations that we ought to be able to have. And so maybe if there's a fault I have with Jurassic Park, it doesn't really help us to think about what it is to be wise people in the image of God who have dominion over creation when real, real life ethical challenges um, come up in our in our world we're just sort of the only thing that we can think of is well scientists could get it wrong and could get eaten off a toilet and i don't want that to happen so let's just not do anything 
Um, I'm not sure that's always the right answer. Mm. So feather dinosaurs weren't controversial enough for you. So you decided <laughs> yeah. we're yeah, going to talk go to about COVID, COVID and vaccines. <laughs> Let's I go understand. to COVID vaccines, yeah. <laughs> and uh, Todd, it's, it's Frankenstein. Frankenstein. It's Frankenstein. <laughs> Frankenstein. That's right. Well, none of you have to agree or even comment on the whole COVID vaccine thing. I'll, I'll just I'll end the episode. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, you know, having having just refreshed myself with reading uh, the original book, um, one of the things that the, the book made very clear was that people have a tendency to underestimate the complexity of, of, uh, of systems. That's, that's the whole thrust of it, is that in our hubris, we think we understand how to manage and control things, and we don't. Um, and, and we see that a little bit in the movies, but it's it's more of just the, the bigger question movie is like what you said, just because we can doesn't mean that we should. And I think the thrust in the movies tends towards let nature do what nature does. Get your hands off. Don't try and have control because no matter what you do, it's going to be bad. I think that might be a misreading of the book yeah. um, in a sense, mm. because the, the book is more about the, the the hubris of thinking that this would be easy um and and that uh we we build ourselves what we think are safeguards that really aren't right we, we try and do things to be uh too efficient too easy on ourselves you know nedry sets up the computer so that everybody can run on you know the whole place can run for three days with minimal help yeah, it's just everything from right here not people out in the park not people you know working on the ground but if you if you paid closer attention to things you'd be able to have dominion better and uh, I think the movies move away from that. It's just, you know, you, you powerful people think you should do things because you want to. And, and uh, that's all wrong. Nature knows better. You know, yeah. uh, and that was one of the, the famous phrases from uh, the first movie with, with Ian Malcolm is dinosaurs had their shot. Right. And they're gone. And, selected and so against they should them. be gone. Yeah. And that that is likewise a, a completely bad reading of things just because something lived and died doesn't mean that it should have died or gone away mm -hmm. we might be all the poorer because it's not here with us right and that's part of what makes us yearn for a movie like this is that we we desire the richness that is gone mm -hmm. we really want there to be dinosaurs i mean I, yeah it'd be messy but <laughs> it was me i really want some of the <laughs> <laughs> some of the dinosaurs out there um and and we're willing to pay that 15 dollars to even twice right so that we can suspend our disbelief for a moment and live in that world that is richer than the one that we have mm -hmm. um yeah. and i think that you know if if i can transport my mind back to before the flood to that edenic realm where the richness is there that's that's what's drawing us that's what's pulling us uh in there so um, nature by itself can't do things right either. You know, yeah. The world was filled with violence. That's not just humans. That was the entire world was filled with violence and needed the, the cleansing destruction of the flood. Um, our dominion mandate was never rescinded. We are supposed to, to um, exert dominion and control. Uh, it doesn't mean that we'll do it perfectly. It doesn't always mean that we'll do it well, but it doesn't, you know, this was not something that was rescinded because we fell. Mm. So it's an obligation. We have no choice uh, but to do this. And if we don't do it, it means that we abdicate our position as uh, those made in the image of God for the purpose of stewarding the world. And, and ultimately, along those same lines, you know, there seems to be this assumption that we can back away and not be involved. And that's not mm -hmm. possible. Um, you know, we are affecting nature every single day. Every single unit of energy and resource that we consume is affecting creation. And, you know, you can argue about whether it, it's a worthwhile trade uh, or not. But but ultimately, you know, the notion that we can somehow back out and not be part of it is, I think, incredibly simplistic. Um, and, and so, you know, a good example of that would be something like, you know, even, you know, something like agriculture, the fact that just by simply farming, just by simply yeah. modifying crops just through selective breeding, we've produced some incredible stuff that is, has led to m many aspects of human health and flourishing just by saying, you know what, I don't want to breed these two together. I want to breed these two together. Um, and those decisions might seem, might seem small, but, you know, given the course of a couple thousand years of, of doing that, um, 
you know, we've, we've, we have changed creation. We have managed it. It's just a question of, are we managing it well or not? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so, yeah, I, I would, I would agree with that for sure that we need to be very conscious of that um, because it's something that we are commanded to do and to do well. And scripture does give us some indications of what stewardship looks like, not generally in the context of environmental stewardship, but in the context of wise investment of not just burying a talent and letting it sit, but of, of using it properly and not wasting it. So I, I mean, I think that there's, like you said, much um, more discussion to be had about that topic. And yeah, I'm, I'm ultimately, that's one of the things I enjoy most about the Jurassic Park movies is that, yeah, it's about dinosaurs eating people. But I mean, we get some some fantastic scenes, especially in the first movie where we have, you know, Gennaro um, and and uh, Hammond and we've got Sat- Sattler and uh, and Grant. And then we've got Malcolm. We've got these three sides kind of going at this question of can we, should we, what does this entail? What does this look yeah. like? Yeah. I mean, that that round table scene in the first film is I think unmatched in many ways, dialogue wise throughout the rest of the, uh, throughout the rest of the franchise, because those are the very conversations that we should be having as Christians and bringing God's word to bear on those issues. Well, I think we've gone on quite a bit here. Thank you. I want to thank (laughs) everybody who uh, agreed to come on our little, very special episode here of uh, let's talk creation. Uh, It's It's been a lot of fun. Um, yeah yeah mm-hmm. dinosaurs sure, are cool sure i think we've got all agree on that um <laughs> so thank you so much gentlemen um paul i don't know us. yes i said thank paul. you for having us yeah yeah no problem <laughs> paul i don't know what's coming up next um we're getting the band back together to do noah there we go oh. <laughs> Russell Crow. let's do it let's do oh. it <laughs> There's a popular film. Um, oh. That's my cue. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. All right, well, for those of you listening or yep. watching, uh, let me remind you, we are avi- we are on the web at corsi.org slash podcast. Uh, you can find us on all the major social media platforms. Um, if you want to contact us uh, through social media, that's great. If you want to contact us um, by... Uh, email, we are podcast at corsi.org. That's C O R E S C I dot O R G. Do remember if you're uh, on a podcast platform, leave us a review. We really appreciate that. That helps us to expand our reach. If you are on YouTube, please leave a like. Uh, subscribe to our channel. Uh, hit that notification bell to get notifications when we put up new content. And uh, this podcast is sponsored by uh, Core Academy of Science, uh, which is a ministry that I am involved with here in the United States. You can find us at C-O-R-E-S-C-I dot org. Uh, go to C-O-R-E-S-C-I dot org slash connect to check out some of the important links that we'd like you to check out and to find all of our social media. C-O-R-E-S-C-I dot org slash donate will take you to our uh, financial support page where you can find out information about how you can uh, come alongside and help us produce this podcast and bring more great content to you. Paul, you are involved with another organization over there in the UK, also a sponsor of our podcast. Tell us about that. Yeah, Biblical Creation Trust. Uh, You can find us on social media. Um, We've got a fairly active Facebook page and uh, you can also check out our website at biblicalcreationtrust.org biblicalcreationtrust.org there's a donate button on our homepage, so if you just click the donate button it'll take you to um, a giving page and all of the information about how you can support our work is there on that page so do check us out we appreciate it very much all right well thanks again for your support thanks for watching thanks for listening i hope you really enjoyed this episode and hey if you want go check out jurassic world dominion if you don't want if you think that's brainwashing well then you definitely should stay away so we will see you again (laughs) in a fortnight and uh yeah i hope you like dinosaurs too (laughs) see you then (laughs) see you then bye-bye thanks for listening to this week's episode of let's talk creation If you have questions, send them to podcast at coreside.org. That's P-O-D-C-A-S-T at C-O-R-E-S-C-I dot org. And be sure to let your friends know about Let's Talk Creation. 
and check us out on social media. Thank you.